Welcome to Referendum TV. <laughs> We've made it. I'm Leslie Riddick. I'm a journalist, a broadcaster. In fact, now I am a broadcaster again. This is an exciting experiment uh, which is going to be lasting for the duration of the festival um, here in the Hill Street Theatre, uh, which is Fringe Venue 41. Um, we're not planning to have a constant audience, but somehow a small select bunch have crept in. Yay! And doubtless, that will, that will be a feature of days to come. Um, we're all supporters of the Yes uh, campaign. We all plan to be voting Yes in the referendum. Um, uh, but we're not all of us slavish supporters of anything, and we're probably as unhappy with that kind of uncritical examination of... Uh, of one side or the other. We're here to examine ideas, not just to kind of reproduce them. Um, and there is, as you can see, no auto queue. There will be plenty of ad libbing. Um, there will be lots of new people. There will be lots of different perspectives. Um, there is lots of voluntary effort. That is what is bringing you everything today. So uh, it will be, mm, I'd say, slightly friskier and perhaps a little ropier than television normally appears. But for all of that, I hope it will be uh, something robust and interesting, um, and I'm sure there will be plenty of mistakes, not least from myself. Um, now, every day we've got different sets of presenters. Um, this is no exception. We normally have one key presenter, or the person that's kind of just talking the most, and then we have co-presenters, and I'm delighted today to introduce me co-mucker, Ian McQuarter. <laughs> Uh, now, this is a bit of a famous first for both of us, actually, Ian, because although we've both been working, well, at one point we worked for the BBC for what seemed like 400 years, but was possibly only 20, um, we never actually appeared together on anything, I think. Is that right? Are you sure about that? I'm We're pretty sure. sure. We must have been but you anyway. see, if you can't even remember it, how unremarkable was that then? No, I know. And, and as you rightly say, this is not about old stages like us. This is meant to be takeover television. Uh, we have so many people now who feel excluded by the mainstream media. Who some of them think the BBC is biased. I don't particularly subscribe to that theory myself, but it's certainly people feel these institutions are kind of, kind of inaccessible uh, and that they're excluded. Now, this is an attempt, as you rightly say, it's an experiment. It's based on a fringe show uh, at the Edinburgh Festival here at the Hill Street Theatre. And the idea is that the kind of people who feel they're excluded by mainstream media who are belittled by the Beeb and who complain about it all, can actually have an opportunity to get on air themselves. Because what's happening now, broadcasting is being transformed by the kind of technology you have in this room. Anybody can now broadcast their own TV shows. OK, you need a, a team of very able and very you know, energetic helpers like here today. But basically, the technology of broadcasting is very different. You and I remember when. To do an outside broadcast, for example, you have huge trucks, oh, that, yes, technical, that's true. huge wires like that. That's all gone now. Well, that was, of course, television. Because I was on steam wireless, so I never even had to brush my hair in the morning, <laughs> we only had to get a satellite truck and aim between buildings so that we could get the signal. Mm. But yes, those, those are all the kind of old days. But you take my point. I mean, it's the kind of transmission of terrestrial television and the big bureaucracies of broadcasting. We're largely built on the fact that it used to be a very uh, difficult and costly mm technical exercise. And with uh, the internet now and, and with uh, you know, digital cameras, practically anybody can do it. And that's what we're trying to show. Sure. Uh, now, you know. the other thing is, um, I, I mentioned at the start that this, is, uh, go this has really been put together by people who plan to vote yes. Just for the sake of any argument whatsoever, that's you. I never say, as a point of principle, I never say how I'm going to vote in any election. And the reason for that is simple. I'm a journalist, uh, a political commentator. It's wrong for me to be backing political parties. Of course, this isn't an election. This is a referendum. And that's totally different. And I have no problem about uh, saying that I'm voting yes in this referendum. Yay! Uh, Yay! I, I'm, I would be amazed if anyone is surprised about that, given what I've been writing in recent years. But uh, let's put it on the record. Because I am actually not a nationalist. I've never been a member of the Scottish National Party, despite, despite what a num number of paranoid Labour peers seem to believe. <laughs> I've never been involved in any... Hello, I've never George Fawkes, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been involved in any political party apart from the Labour Party, and that was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not, I, I come from a non-nationalist background. In fact, in many ways, I be, would have been a kind of instinctive unionist, because uh, probably like you, when I grew up, the idea of nationalism was a bit offensive. And if you see many nationalist political parties across the rest of Europe, particularly the small ones, they often come from the right, the far right, and they often oppose immigration. Now, 
That's a totally different situation here that we have in Scotland. This is civic nationalism. It's not narrow-minded nationalism. It's not even the property of the SNP. Tremendously important to remember that this week because what everybody says, you know, because of Alex Salmon's alleged beating at the great debate this week, that that's some kind of setback for the Yes campaign. You and I know it's not really about the SNP at all. It's a much, much wider movement altogether. It's a civic democratic movement for political change. And I have absolutely no problem about uh, saying that I, I wholeheartedly support it, yeah. particularly because we have been faced with this uh, binary choice, which is not really what anybody wants, because people like me who are not natural supporters of independence would have been arguing for federalism had there been an opportunity to do that. Well, I've got to say, since you've revealed your mm. past, my mm. little dirty secret is that uh, I was a liberal way back in the days before oh the Liberal God. Democrats. I'm, right, that's, okay. I'm leaving I don't know. now. I'm I, was, sorry. I was 14, came across <laughs> from Northern Ireland. The young Liberals were actually backing troops out. They're the only people mm. who did at the time. So I joined the young Liberals and left four years later. But, um, yes, but you're not so in the SNP either. I mean yes, absolutely. And since then, I have not been in any political party. Mm. But yes, it's a good point to make. And the point there was federalism has been part of the Liberal philosophy from, for all those years. Yeah, and yet Gladstone. for all that mm. long time, it has never really been front of house, even now when the Lib Dems are actually part of government. But anyway, well, that's a good point, and that's also what's uh, uh, what many people find so objectionable about the way in which this referendum has been staged. They're forced into unacceptable alternatives of independence or the status quo. And we've had, you know, this week we had the three UK parties, unionist parties, signing this document saying, "Oh, there'll be federalism or something like it." Lots more powers to the Scottish Parliament. And I don't think anyone seriously takes well, this was one Look at the Liberal Democrats. They've been supporting federalism for over 100 years. Ian McGuarter, I need to get a word in that. Did it, be, did it, be, okay. <laughs> did it um, become part of the agenda when they formed the coalition? That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, what I'd like to say is, is that um, one of the grouses that I really had mm -hmm. about the debate, and we're going to come on to that in just a second, is precisely that, that the very same day there had been this Devo Moore plus plus announced by the three unionist parties, and actually, I wonder, and it's a question for everybody watching there, you please join us on Twitter. Our hashtag is referendum TV. Um, has anybody actually quizzed those parties on precisely what the deal is? Because, you know, every, every offer that's mm. been made by the SNP in the white paper, everything has been gone over, every single cross T and dotted I. And yet here is what should be a monumentally important piece mm. of the offer for the, for the Scottish public. And nobody's actually asked, well, what is it in welfare that you're planning to devolve? And actually, just by the by, how could anybody, like housing benefit was one of the Tories' proposals, how can that easily be devolved when that is about to be taken into universal credit, which is mm -hmm. a UK system? Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it's not doable. I'm only saying all the time what we're hoping to do is put the same degree of scrutiny on the things that will be core to our lives if we stay in the UK Mm -hmm. as the extraordinary scrutiny that has been devoted to the yes side. Yes, everyone says there's, there's great uncertainties and risks because of we don't know what the currency is going to be like. We don't know whether there will be border posts or whether, whether a Westminster government would, would, would try to stop immigration from Scotland, all this kind of stuff. But actually, the risks and uncertainties about the status quo so-called, are just as great. Well, let, me get, no let me get to the papers, actually, because mm. some of the risks are sitting on the front page. Um, I, I merely offer Boris Johnson. <laughs> now, you know, we're, we're going through this in perhaps a different order than planned, but, you know, most of the headlines are actually about now looking back again at Alex Salmon's performance in that STV debate. This one from The Telegraph, Salmon's leadership under fire after debate disaster. There's old Boris, who we now know is trying to get a seat. Coyley says he's not sure if he'll get one. I write. Um, but yes, that's the Europe, uh, Europhobic um, Boris Johnson perhaps some risks attached to that. Well, just imagine, can you imagine the, the, the um, a council leader in Scotland, Gordon Madsen says he's going to become an MSP. Do you think that would be all over the front pages of the UK media? Of course not. Yeah. That's Boris. Boris. That's a measure of the parochialism, uh, in my view, about the UK media, that they're obsessed. And if anybody wants to wonder about in, in that, London. thinking that mm. is the Daily Telegraph, all of these additionalise. So actually, you could put any front, front cover on that that you want, but you choose to put what you do. Now, The Sun has chosen to put wakey, wakey, ek, um, um, see he seems to have had a lie in after TV clash. That was interesting because actually the Sun had a poll um, which came out just uh, yesterday, I think, of 1,700 people, which seemed to suggest that um, Alex Sam had actually won the debate. A lot yeah. of people very critical of that because it was a, a sort of online poll. Yeah, the Guardian ICM poll, uh, they had a snap poll uh, afterwards. And uh, while it showed that, you know, after the great debate, they thought, 
Darling had won. Nevertheless, there was a significant increase in support for uh, yes overall. And also, it, it, it appeared to show uh, there had been some criticism of the Guardian ICM poll that its sample was too small, but nevertheless, over four or 500 people were involved in it, and it seemed to indicate that there was a degree of increased support among women yeah. and among the undecided, because Alice Adara's darling's very finger-pointing style doesn't go all that down it's, it's all that well with those actually, groups. And I mean, this is what, I think this is a, a puzzle that yet to be explored. I mean, you've written today in the Herald, I've written in Newsnet Scotland, and it, it's, I mean, on the night we were both there, you were actually in the spin room, I was outside watching the thing for the news channel, um, and it did feel like Alex Salmon allowed the debate to go off his best turf, um, and he wasn't really performing as we know he can. Mm -hmm. So I think he'd say those two things, and yet actually the statistics from that Guardian snap poll were really quite extraordinary, um, in that the people who were still undecided at the end of the event, it was something like 74% thought Alex Salmond mm. had won it. When it came down to questions like who had the best arguments, <laughs> um, it was something like 56% of people overall mm. thought that um, he had the best arguments. Now, I know this point has been made. It was only 500 people, and it's not statistically valid. I have to say, as somebody who pours over regularly and has done for years over polls um, that are UK sample polls, uh, which have 1,000 as the usual number, mm. and which then mm -hmm. tend to have only 100 Scots uh, to, de to demonstrate demographic differences. Mm -hmm. We've been constantly struggling with an under-surveying of Scottish opinion. So yeah. actually, in the great scheme of things, 500 is quite often more than we've been dealing mm -hmm. with to look at things like our comparative views on immigration mm -hmm. or the bedroom tax, for example. Those judgments have been made, are the Scots different, on the basis of 100 people, mm -hmm. usually. Yeah. So there's all of that to say about the polls. Here <laughs> we are with the Herald, Defiant Salmond, fights back after bruising TV poll battle. Um, I didn't catch too much of his press conferences, did you? He's actually speaking, um, he's just finished doing First Minister's questions today, which I imagine will have been a frisky encounter. Did you see any of that? No, I saw him at uh, Business for Scotland, the conference the next day, and it was very interesting because his, his style had changed significantly and also the content because um, he, he was saying then what many people wish he'd said the previous night. He was accepting that there are alternatives to a currency union if uh, Westminster decides that it's absolutely going to be opposed to any, any currency sharing. Uh, he, he says now uh, that there are alternatives, and there are alternatives. I mean, uh, we all know what they are. But he did say that on the night. Do you think he should be just going for a plan B now? Yeah, yeah, I think he should certainly spell out that the plan B exists. Now, I mean, the reason he hasn't done that in the past, for obvious reasons, because as soon as he does that, people will say, oh, well, you know, Scotland's going to have his own currency. It'll be, be a banana republic like Panama or Argentina. But that's the wrong way to look at it. I mean, there's lots of co countries who have their own currencies, as you well know. I mean, you know, Norway, Switzerland, Denmark, they, they do perfectly well with their own currencies. I mean, countries like Hong Kong, which shadow the dollar, I mean, they've done extremely well so also. Do, do so in today's, today's in international economic environment, it's not at all a, a serious problem to have uh, an independent currency. Do you think by the time the BBC debate comes around, which I think is, is it August the 25th? Yeah. Um, will he have got his plan B together by then? Should he have? He'll should be he certainly, have? what they're saying is he'll be much more expansive, and I think he probably will. I think he'll, you know, it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't stand up for him continuously to be saying, oh no, despite what all the leaders of the UK parties, because remember it wasn't just George Osborne, but it was endorsed by Nick Clegg, it was endorsed uh, by, by Labour. They all said, no, Scotland's not going to get uh, uh, to share the pound okay. after independence. Now, uh, most people realise that that is bluster. Uh, that it would damage the UK economy as a whole if there was to be some Hadrian's, some kind of financial Hadrian's wall set up so that Scots were barred from using the pound. That would have a serious and damaging impact on cross-border mm. trade. So most people, I think, accept that that is a political position which would, which would collapse very soon after a yes vote. Now just to demonstrate that mm -hmm. Ian and I don't always sort of see completely eye to eye on everything, my biggest grouse actually about the entire debate was that although the questions of currency, the pound and all those financial issues are important, um, basically they are not the whole of the independence debate. And I've seen lots of people, in fact, many London-based commentators astonished mm that such an important moment could simply be devoted to two hours of talking about the pound. And, and in big issues, like for example, yesterday when the Scottish Parliament voted to get rid of Trident, that mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. actually you know, welcomes coming from across the world saying, thank goodness some people are going to make that move. Yeah, the former, me, the former mayor of Hiroshima said It strikes me that, that, that all those issues are, are really important for, for, for the yes 
campaign absolutely. if you like I mean, to get over. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's uh, you know, the Scottish Parliament, there's the Scottish Parliament voting to scrap Trident. I mean, you know, it's, it's, that's a significant, okay, it may not have formal power over uh, defence. And it hasn't managed to get on moment. any front page anywhere. Not reported anywhere. And the Mayor of Hiroshima is saying that, you know, this is a, is a significant moment. It would yeah. have a great impact. Uh, across the world, it would make a serious. It'd be a serious moral stance that an independent Scotland could take here, as part of the United, uh, formerly mm -hmm. United Kingdom, as part of what yeah. was, uh, uh, you know, uh, a nuclear power. To be, for moral reasons, foregoing that in future, that would send a very strong message across the globe. But here we are again. Uh, final paper of today, Daily Record. Ouch. Um, <clears throat> and I suppose this is the thing that. Again, a grouse about this, I suppose, is that things are so much focused on the leaders, um, on the big men, if you like, and on mm. these kind of set piece debates. And actually, we know from past experience, whether it's been Nick Clegg, who did very well in debates and then sort of disappeared at the polls. Um, we, we can see that sometimes that really doesn't translate into the big game changer that everyone expects. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm a very much of the view, having done, actually, I'm told, 110 meetings since September of all sorts, actually, some to do with my books, so, but some to do with the Yes campaign. Um, it, it's more a kind of small change everywhere under the radar that probably mm -hmm. transforms places and that big moments like this are not the silver bullet that everyone expects. No, well hopefully. Well, everyone's saying that this referendum campaign has revived the town hall meeting, has revived public meetings across Scotland, and certainly my own experience of going around Scotland is that there has been a great engagement, tremendous engagement in this decision, far greater than in the previous referendums in 1997 and 1979. And while it has, but for the press, it's been very much a one-issue campaign. It's all been about the pound, partly because we are in a situation where the UK press is very influential in Scotland. The Scottish press tends to take a unionist line as well, apart from notable exceptions like the Sunday Herald. They concentrate on this specific issue. They're also inclined to present politics in a very presidential style. It's mm -hmm. about party leaders. It's about parties. And actually, that's kind of redundant in this uh, referendum campaign. For a start, you know, it's not all about the SNP. That's what we said right from the start. And also, you know, uniquely in my experience, this is something which, where these grassroots have been you know, extremely well involved. We'll, we'll hopefully, we're going to hear more from these people, not just from yes. people like you and me. They're going to hear from these people, and that's what this program is really meant to be all about. Well, indeed, that's a very good point. And let's um, actually start to shuffle ourselves on now that we've looked at the papers. I think uh, we're going to have one of our first guests on here today. So uh, let's have our first referendum TV guest. Give it up for Sarah Sheridan. <laughs> Lots of microphones. Yes, exactly. Yes. With mics. Now, um, we were talking there about the, the whole campaign not being simply, uh, you know, the SNP or Malik Salmond or whatever. And that's not to belittle them, actually. I, I think it's worth saying we actually wouldn't be here today unless Alex Salmond's leadership of the SNP had led to sufficient election victories that a referendum was even doable. So I'm not uh, in any way dissing the SNP, but it's a movement that I think we're in. And the reason I say that specifically about yourself is because I saw you as part of the Yesterville tour ah. in Dundee. Yes, oh, I was okay. that person deep they in the back. Light, so I didn't, I it's didn't always see very you. bright lights, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, you did an amazing thing because, well, in fact, the whole Yesterville tour, if anybody's missed it, um, has been a fantastic thing. I was actually doing a small tour of the Western Isles, um, hence my. Uh, Hence my little Bukhor badge, I don't know if you can see it here, which is Gaelic for you should. Interestingly, the Gaels do not have words for yes and no. <laughs> so well, actually, neither does Irish and Gaelic. Um, the both languages don't have that concept. They simply put the verb back to say you should or you shouldn't. Hence, you will, you will, you will. I merely, I merely offer that in. So not many people know that. <laughs> I want one of those badges now. And uh, we'd followed the Yesterville all the way in our little tour, Angus, Brenda, McNeil, and myself. We'd been following Yesterville all the way up the Western Isles, missing them by a day at every turn. So that's why I was ah, delighted to come along to Dundee you landed and see in Dundee. you in action, finally. And I'd never talked about politics before. That was my first, because I'm know i a historical novelist. I normally talk about the 1950s and books and reading and inspiration and all that kind of stuff. So that was my first And you outing. gave up reading novels, didn't you? Yeah. For six months. To be right, so you could it decide. wasn't quite six months, but I knew I had to give up something. I was very, very busy, and I knew I needed to look at the issue. So I decided something had to go. So I decided I was going to stop reading fiction, and I was going to start reading economics and politics. And Can I take you back even before? Yeah. 
yeah. that because what, what struck me from what you said there was that you started off as a no voter. Yeah. Yeah, right. I think the way you make decisions, I mean as a novelist you know this anyway, the way, you, the, the way you, that people make decisions is they have a knee-jerk reaction for just about everything. Psycho psychiatrists and psychologists have done um, tests on this and even if you are deciding what you're going to have for lunch, um, you make the decision of what you're going to have for lunch and then you think about all the reasons about why you ought to have that for lunch. So, um, and that's the way we make every decision pretty much. And so my immediate thing was no. But I'm why? Why would it be immediate and automatic? I think for me it was I didn't want to be small. I associated being small with being perhaps parochial. I spend a lot of time down south. There's 150 book festivals all over the UK. Last year I did 80 events. <laughs> so I spend a lot of time all over the place and it just seemed to me a sort of, it didn't make any sense to me. I didn't want to be small and I didn't especially want to be inward looking because I'm an internationalist. Mm -hmm. um, and so then so I when did you start to kind of wobble on that? When did that one not seem to fit the bill? It just, I was watching stuff on YouTube, I was listening. I mean, it got to a point where you couldn't stand at a bus stop. And I think it's still a bit like that sometimes, about someone saying, have you thought about this reference? You know, so everyone was talking about it. And I was hearing points of view. And I thought, well, hang on, maybe the inward looking campaign is in fact the no campaign. Oh, I don't know enough about this. Oh, it's a very serious decision. I can't, I, I have to know more. And it was just that. And I thought, I'm just going to set aside my no become undecided and just use all my research skills to try and figure out what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And so the research skills then, how did, how did you apply that? Because, you know, a lot of the time you hear well, the public saying they want more information mm. and yet we're actually awash with information. We are. But you, you need to effectively, you need to effe become more of a sceptic probably and, yeah. and more of an effective wear of information, you know, because there's competing sets, aren't there? Everything's propaganda. I mean, not only in this, if you're, if you're writing a, a, a book about 1820 and you go back and you look at original journals and letters and diaries, everyone's coming from some direction. Everything you read is propaganda. So you've always had to do so that I've, as you, a I've always had novelist. to do that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And normally I do it on the line of the story, you know, whatever the story I'm writing is, therefore I, I have a kind of agenda of, of what I'm looking for. Um, so when it came to this, it was what was I interested in? What were the things that mattered to me? Because it isn't a party political thing. There is, there's, there's mm -hmm. everything. There's um, Trident. There's do you care about the NHS more than you care about Trident? Do you care about the welfare system? Do you care about people care about crazy things? You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you, you chat to people and they're like, I'm voting this because. But what about you? What would be the. Well, that was the issues? journey. That was like, oh, what is most important to me? And it was a sense of, sense of social justice, the NHS, the welfare state. Um, and then gradually, as I watched, m became more and more educated in, in, in it, perhaps, um, I was watching these sort of traditional politicians and Westminster politicians just talking nonsense, just trying to scare people. And I thought, this is a very corrupt. I mean, so, so was I the Feb February the 13th a date for you then? That's the one etched in many people's uh, minds as the day that Gideon told us we couldn't have the pound. Yeah, that was one I thought, oh, I bet we do have the pound. I just don't, I, I, it's not that you, you, I always knew that you couldn't trust politicians, of course. What kind of idiot doesn't know that you, can't, you, know, you shouldn't trust a politician? But actually seeing the scale of it and then starting to look at Westminster and this archaic and incredibly corrupt, very heavy, very costly and actually quite ineffective system of government and I've always been a wee bit left I'm not radical socialist but I'm kind of to the left of well actually these days I'm probably to the left of labor which is a, a little bit scary um, and and something I'd never thought I'd see myself being but there I am but that, that's a so I think that's a really important point because mm. actually you're to the left of the entire political culture of England there is not a fag paper between them there really isn't a fag paper between them when you start to look at, at what they're saying. And then they just you will mean try. Labour and the SNP. <laughs> I mean the Tories and the Liberals and Labour. Mm. And but it's also the structures. I mean, my husband, Chris, we do a podcast together and he'd mm. come up with, um, I didn't realise this, I think there are, now correct me if I'm wrong, 760 peers in the House mm. of Lords. Way over Draw, Drawing something like 300 quid a day. A That's £44,000 if and you made that a salary. And bishops. Yeah, There's unelected. bishops in there, which I find just extraordinary. I know. And I mean, I, I sort of <laughs> knew some of this stuff already. And then suddenly thought, oh, I'm going to become a bit militant. I can just see it coming on. I'm going to be militant any second. And there I was. And I was like, we've got to do this. There's, there's just, I couldn't find a no reason anymore. So tell me a bit about the yes of all gigs then. Because yeah. well, know, I only did the one. Different. I only did the yes. one. And I did, I did one with a bus party up in Stirling. There's been lots and lots of stuff. And I blogged on for the National Collective. And um, I've written a bit about BBC bias for the Huffington Post and things. So um, I've sort of got involved in with lots of different things. Mm -hmm. um, I think the creative community in Scotland 
I suppose we're all used to talking in public and doing stuff in public, so it's kind of a natural forum mm -hmm. to go out there and, and get on a stage and say, here's what I think. Or so here's what's two going questions on. then. One is why, I mean, it's been asked many times, why are so many of the artists or creative community, why are so many artists voting yes? That, can I speak for all artists or I all know, women exactly. or all Scots? Can I can't. I would say we're n we're, it's not necessarily that much m of a greater percentage because I know people who are voting no as well. That's completely, you know, that's completely fine. But we are mousy. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's probably more so where you it stands. You, you know a lot of creatives who are voting no. Are I know do some creatives. Do you think they're less because you don't hear from yeah. them very much? Do you? I don't know what that's about. I have no idea what that's about. I mean, I don't want to live in a country where everyone votes the same. Those are not nice countries to live in. Mm. So we want a spectrum. We want we want the debate. So um, I, I don't understand why people say they're afraid. What did you make of the great debate, the, the one we saw this week? I've only seen clips of it because I was out speaking at an event. Yeah. Um, so I've only seen clips of it. But I mean, it wasn't the greatest debate in the world, was it? And I've seen Alex Salmon do fantastically better. But so I, I think there's, I find myself, I don't know about you, Ian, but the number of times I've been on things, uh, you know, because the other mm. question I was going to ask you was about, you've written about BBC bias. Ian made a mention mm. at the start that he doesn't think there's a, 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 an overt bias against no. the Yes campaign within the Beeb. And I'd go along with that, um, having worked there for a long time, I can't think of a single occasion in which mm. a production team has sat down and said, let's shut out the yes voice mm -hmm. or let's not have na at the SNP. To me, that's it's a more subtle thing. Yeah, that's it's, the same bias. It's that, it's that actually there's the establishment is mm -hmm. basically what, what is that the pulse of a, uh, almost everything, it strikes me, in, in, in Britain and Scotland. And the establishment sets the pace of news. So that very often is what causes the bias because the establishment at the moment are all lined up behind the no cause. And it's the alternative voices like ourselves, hello, sitting in small <laughs> but marvellous theatres who, who find this, you know, who, fi who, who, are, who are trying to put forward a different cause. I think it's very akin to um, the bias that there is against women. You know, everywhere we go, we say, oh, we don't have any bias against mm. women, but we still don't have equal yeah. amounts of places on boards. We don't get the same kind of, um, well, even women get 77.5% uh, of the amount in ad of advances that male writers get and about a third of the review coverage that male writers get. So even in my industry, and I've written about that as well. And people are not going out not to publish women, but it's just there in the background. It's the way you behave and changing the way you behave is really really difficult yeah. you know as a as a group and I did talk about that that night at, at Yesterville in Dundee talking about in the 50s um, my mother retraining my father not to be terribly 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 sexist as thousands of women did over that entire decade and we owe them you know they changed the world they changed the world. Opinion pollsters keep telling us that mm. um, the main problem for the Yes campaign is women, that women are really... We are a huge argument. problem, aren't we difficult? Women are the problem because they mm. don't, aren't interested in independence or what have you, and uh, you know that they're more establishment minded or they're more concerned with or the whole. maybe harder kind of to stuff. get. I know, wait, wait, you know, exactly. Well, that's what mm. I was going to ask you. What do you think about those <laughs> ways of interpreting it? I can't speak for all women. Who on earth is going to be brave enough to speak for all women? That would be a mental thing to try and do. I, I think among my friends, there are probably more women undecided than men undecided. I hope they're moving towards yes. I think. Do there's any reason for that? I don't know. I, uh, people may have di different decision-making processes. And I think standing up and saying what you think is not a traditional, like it's more a bloke thing than a female thing in general, probably. So I think that some people certainly are probably saying, well, I don't know, I don't know. They've maybe made up their mind. They know. I think uh, if I can get, you know, bring in as, as, a, mm -hmm. as a woman. Yeah. <laughs> You're surrounded. Um, what, what, I I, what I've noticed um, actually doing, doing a lot of talks about the book Blossom mm -hmm. is there is a huge interest uh, in women in those audiences because mm -hmm. it's not about the technicalities. It's not about the pound, mm -hmm. the currency, the whatever. It's about... W what it would take for Scotland to be better. It's mm -hmm. about the sick man and woman of Europe status. It's about inequality, mm -hmm. unfairness, uh, dispossession of land, um, the indoorness of Scotland. Mm -hmm. It's about all these things that just get brushed aside. The quality of our lives, mm -hmm. what makes us get up in the morning, those kind of big, big issues. And above all, childcare and questions mm -hmm. about uh, child well-being and comparisons with countries where they do it better so that you can see actually it doesn't really need to be that way. And stories, I think mm. people really relate to stories. I mean, mm. perhaps you would naturally agree with that. Mm. And so much of the debate so far has been statistics, not stories. Mm. Um, and these kind of, if you like, technical aspects of what would happen should independence go ahead, 
well, actually, we haven't really properly established what the job is. Mm. You know, to we've be, got to be two fair, tool to be sets fair, and we haven't established fair, the job. To be fair, there was one big uh, offer in the white paper independence, and that was free childcare. Mm. And no party uh, has, has yet uh, equaled that, no mm. UK party. Ed Miliband said he was going to move down that road. He never really mm. did. So that is, it is a significant moment, I think, when mm. the... Uh, Scottish government actually made that the centrepiece mm -hmm. of the independence project. But that is great for men as well as for women. I mean, we are shopping around for better government. Mm -hmm. In my head, that's what we're doing. We're having a look around, shopping around for better government, and then we'll make our decision. And actually, I think in the course of that, also thinking um, wh wh who puts priorities on things, because it's OK mm -hmm. to have a policy. But I think a lot of people that I've met will say, has this just been stuck on because basically the SNP need yes vote, women yes mm. voters? Now, actually, in many circumstances, that's what creates change. Yes, mm. that governments need to co-opt certain interest groups. I'm, that's I'm okay with works. that. Exactly. Mm. But I think what's more than that, since you asked the question, Ian, is that there needs to be a constant reference. That should have been Alex Salmon's first contribution. Not uh, things about, was, you know, it was not, not things after, about, it was not about uh, aliens. No, but not oh, things about week, aliens yeah. coming in. Yeah. It should mm. have been a direct question to, you know, will the UK give free childcare <coughs> to Scottish children? Mm. Mm. Maybe next time. He'll be there's watching good, this. That's a good thought. He'll be like, next time I'm on the podium. Well, mm. that's a good thought. And thank <laughs> you very much for those right. and for everything, Sarah. Thanks for what are you me. off to next? Are you doing things in the festival? Uh, book festival. Next week I'm doing a, an event about my 1950s murder mystery. So I'm looking forward to that. Right. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Thanks for having um, me. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Okay, well, we've, uh, we've been having um, no end of uh, campaigning videos, uh, tormented uh, audiences, cinema audiences around the country. In fact, there was, uh, some of them actually had to be uh, removed because there was such a negative audience reaction. Well, uh, a band from Dundee called Orc Mischief have been making their own videos, and they're going to join us now and tell us all about it. Hey. Hello. 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 This is my Ooh. band. This is the ah. band. Yeah. This is the band. You move. Okay. You move slowly and stealthily, um, in a kind of, in yeah. a cool way. Well, no. well, we're told to do that exact. T to move slowly and stealthily, yes. right? And you do what you're told, even at this young age. Well, that was the first media training we've <laughs> ever had was <laughs> in the in the <laughs> corridor. It's a crash course. Yeah. Right, Sharp. Well, you've done it. Well done. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, Orc mischief, everybody. Yeah. yeah. Tell us. Hey. Tell us about your videos. Yeah. Tell us about your videos, because it's all about Tartan Kitsch, isn't it? Well, yeah. Tartan Kitsch, yeah, I yeah. like that's a good that's genre. Actually, yeah, maybe mm. we should call our album Tartan Kitsch. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been in a band for um, about a year mm. and, and just kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek songs about various different things, not just um, like satire or political political discussions, but we made um, we, we took the opportunity to, to kind of run on the back of the independence debate and make a video um, for one of our songs, which is called Independent Scotland, and it's basically just a massive list of all the... It's a the brilliant, it's actually a brilliant Scotland parody. Have. It's a brilliant yeah. parody of SNP uh, party people broadcast. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. you can yeah. see them from, from, from 20 years ago um, that are actually pretty similar to, yeah. to what we've See, done. we kind of took that cultural cringe and just drove right through it. We yeah. just went with it, celebrated yeah. it. Yeah, celebrate, exactly. Do you feel the cultural cringe too? Um, am I allowed to speak? He's yeah. not mic'd up, <laughs> so that's why. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, not mic'd up. I feel it as well. Yeah, yeah you're all into the cultural yeah. cringe, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. What did you think of Barrowman then? Excellent. The I think uh, Barrowman and uh, who was his partner again? It uh, was um, Karen Dunbar. Karen Dunbar. Karen Dunbar. Yeah. They're, they released their uh, Scottish satirical song just the day before us. Basically, so yeah. So uh, they beat us to it. So they kind of beat us to it. Well, uh, a couple of our friends actually on Facebook um, messages they're saying, oh, okay, they've done the exact same thing as you guys, but just on a much bigger scale. <laughs> maybe, maybe they had a slightly different budget to us, I don't yeah. know. It was kind of a hand <laughs> held up, up someone rose uh, well for us. Uh, when you're talking about budgets, this has also perhaps precluded us from doing what we wanted to do, which is play your video in at this point. But you can see it presumably on YouTube or Yeah, where? so we've got, I mean, we're, we're obviously on social media. We're on um, facebook.com forward slash the, or the org mischief um, and youtube.com forward slash the org mischief. Mm. And if you search for independent Scotland or mischief, then you'll then And you'll you're doing it. a show at the... We're, we're playing mm. um, for all this week. We've done uh, five shows, is it now? It seems like 500. 500, yeah, yeah we're a bit, a bit worse for red, but we're, we're getting there. We're doing um, um, shows every night at half past seven at the Ibis Hotel just on Southbridge, mm. which you can access up on the campaign. And you didn't actually start from a sort of SNP nationalist perspective, did no, you? No, absolutely not. I mean, the, the band itself formed just through 
the fact that we were all friends and in, um, in different bands. Um, we were just actually on, on our way up to a show on, on the A9 to Inverness and just kind of started writing these um, songs. But obviously, through the through the debate, we've, this is one of the things that we've chosen to write a song about. So um, is it just a song, or do you actually support independence? Well, I think like we've all got our, like, our individual views. We yeah. didn't come okay. together and go, let's So, yes, write no? It. Yes. Yes. My grand's watching no. <laughs> <laughs> you've, got, you've got some high-tech grand we she's watching this on. She's, she's got a Union Jack in her front garden, so and we can't actually... Yes. Okay, yeah. so you're kind of mostly there, and you're, you're yeah. cool. You're allowed oh. to have whatever view you want, obviously. He's getting yeah. there. Mm. Um, he's the talking no. Yeah, well, he's, he, he's the only bass player we know. Who yeah. And Dun Dundee, I mean, Dundee, famously, Michael Mara, St. Andrew of the Wound Absolutely, Mill, yeah. utter heroes, yeah, actually, absolutely for anybody brilliant. who likes We've barking. Heard that yeah. lot, fantastic. Uh -huh. Were they big influences? Oh, absolutely. I think um, I think Dundee's, um, a lot of people go on about the future for Dundee, actually, but you know, Dundee's past is filled with culture, especially mm -hmm. comedy. Um, like you're saying, Ma Michael Mann and Sir Andrews are, are both big influences, certainly for myself, mm -hmm. um, over the past couple of years. But it's interesting because else. Mike actually was uh, anti-independence. Um, yeah. He died so sadly last year. Yeah. Uh, he was, he, and he, actually picking up the point that Sarah Sheridan had made, mm -hmm. I think I never managed to speak to him about this actually, but um, you know, his thing was total internationalism. That was really his, his big thing. The old thing. left, was it? Yes, yeah, he was yeah, an yeah. absolute stalwart of the old left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, it, you know, obviously it's not a kind of, you know, monopoly of, of any view on any particular Absolutely, side. Yeah. Um, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think what you were saying about, um, I, I think it was um, Michelle who was saying about a, 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 a yeah, big minded. Sarah, now, Sarah yeah, yeah, we're yeah. friends, yeah. Well, uh, what Sarah was saying was, that she thought the no campaign was the sort of small-minded campaign, and I, I kind of agree with that. Although it's saying Scotland would go on their own and become a yeah. small country, I mean, you get to stand on your own amongst <laughs> like other international but I, states. I think people have lots of views on that, but I mean, I I do write a wee thing myself about why artists and creatives seem to be so much more on the yes side. And actually, having gone to a folk festival in Norway, Gaithersburg with a whole lot of Scottish musicians. Mm -hmm. um, I was having a conversation with that them because every single one of them planned to vote yes. And what they said was, it's because they travel around so much. In mm. a funny kind of way, it was the opposite yeah. of what Sarah said at the start. Uh -huh. Because they go to so many small countries. You Who know, see, you can see, see the, 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 fruit, the benefits of it. People's culture is absolutely central, yep. mm, not yeah. a secondary thing that you do after you've done the usual mm -hmm. British bit and God Save the Queen and everything. Mm. You, you know, then you get your wee Scottish moment. It's actually the centre of culture yep. and it's well funded. No, I, could, I completely see that point mm. of view. Um, again, like I, I'm not really sure where the where the kind of artist, um, the percentage of artists, how, how it's grown, why that is, to be honest. So you, your perception is, is that, it, that creatives, Absolutely, like to call yeah, them, they're mostly moving towards yes. I think certainly at the fringe, um, one of my friends is actually a tour guide in the city and he's he's noticed that, um, I don't know if there was a poll done or if they just looked at the, di the different shows that were on, but there's certainly, during the Edinburgh Fringe, there's there's yeah. more kind of leaning towards the Okay, yes. well look, we're running yes, out of time, but um, this is Takeover Television, so tell us a bit about, how your, your videos are extremely professionally produced. How did you manage to get that off the ground? Well, um, basically, like, I'm just a super talented guy. Um, <laughs> no, um, I've never, I've ne we've never had any formal training or anything like that. It's just basically um, a half-decent camera, and we just, we just spent a day, basically, from 8 o'clock in the morning till the back of midnight. Um, just so anyone can do it? Basically, anyone can do it. Like, yeah. I mean, it's very, very easy, especially nowadays, like you were saying, Ian, at the start. Um, it's very, very easy now to get off the ground with these kind of things and look, make them look very good. Mm. We know a lot of bands in Dundee and a lot of friends who do their own videos and look professional. A lot of artists are just releasing music videos on their phone now, just filmed on their iPhones and stuff. Okay. So it definitely can be done by anybody. And it's 7.30 at the Ibis Theatre for the rest of the festival, yeah? Yep, yeah. And okay. Orc Mischief till Saturday, actually. Till Saturday, yeah. Till Saturday, Saturday, okay, still Saturday. great. And uh, Facebook, forward uh, slash Orc Mischief. Thanks a lot. Well. Thank you. As the Dundee la lads depart, um, our next uh, person on the spot is uh, Tomek Borkovi, although I'm pretty sure I may have mispronounced that. Um, oh, it's not actually. Mm. I'm now skipping along too fast, and I think I've possibly chucked my piece of paper away. Yes, this just I shows it's live. I've indeed, indeed. Well, everyone uh, kind of accepts that, Alice, uh, that um, Alex Salmond uh, w uh, said what he meant to say at the great debate uh, the next day when he appeared at the Business for a Scotland conference is when he started talking more constructively about the options, the alternatives, the possibility of a plan 
a, a plan B to uh, a, a common currency with uh, the rest of the UK. So we've got uh, Ivan McKee, who is uh, director of uh, Business for Scotland, and he's uh, here with his uh, wife, uh, Eva. If they want to come in, um, we'd have words with them. Here you go. Yay! Eva. Hi. Yep. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, good to see you. Okay, well, tell us first of all, Ivan, tell us first of all about uh, what you heard Simon saying at the uh, Business for Scotland uh, conference. Are you, do you welcome him now expanding this out from beyond just only a common currency? That's the only option. They're not prepared to consider any alternatives. Now he appears to be thinking about uh, well something I think more there's constructive. Th there's a couple of parts, to it, a couple of strands to it. There's the economic aspect of it, where the reality is that this isn't the biggest issue. Um, there's a lot of issues that are far bigger than the currency. It's been picked on as a political mechanism by the No campaign to try and drive some wedges and raise some issues and, and create some uncertainty, basically, which is the fundamental of their campaign. So, from a political point of view, you can absolutely understand why. The strategy has been to keep it very, very tight in terms of the currency. What's, not what's your favourite plan B? From an economic point of view, frankly, I'm very relaxed about it. And I do meetings up and down the country and I get this question and I talk about the Nordic countries where you've got four different countries, each one with a, with a different currency option and all of them work perfectly well. And they basically cover the range of options from being in a currency zone as Finland is, when a tied currency like uh, like Denmark has. Have mm. and those, all of those options yeah, so they're, and they're in and out and of and the European Union, well. aren't they? Because so Norway's out, it has its own exactly. currency, the krona, and so is Denmark's so in and it has its own currency. Right, Denmark's tied to the euro, um, it floats, uh, whereas Sweden floats freely. So all of the options that are in the fiscal paper are actually covered in the real world. In Scandinavia. So why has it been so much reluctance to talk about it then? Well, I think that it's from the political point of view because it's been seen as a no campaign as an opportunity to create uncertainty and doubt, and they're trying to drive that agenda. Um, and uh, it's not quite as simple as that, is it? It's, you can't just just blame the unionists for it. I mean, it's probably been a policy decision, particularly by the SNP, yeah. not to raise the prospect, the possibility of there being a separate Scottish independent currency because of what they see as the potential political consequences of that. Yes, it's political, it's not economic. I mean, the economics, any one of those options will work perfectly well. It's been shown in the real world they work perfectly well, and in theory they'll work perfectly well. So I think be relaxed about any one of those. I think logically, for practical reasons, it's going to be sterling at the beginning, whatever anybody says, mm. because there isn't time to do anything else apart from anything else. And people have got pounds in their pockets, and that will continue. So do about that. What happens in the future, we'll have plenty of time. 10 or 20 years down the road to look at other options. And there's a whole range of possibilities that you can move in different directions, mm. what suits, what, what suits. But in terms of where the campaign's at, um, I think it makes sense to, um, to, to, to state the reality, which is we're going to be using the pound on day one. Okay. From an economic point of view, it makes perfect sense from the rest of the UK's government. Matter of fact, it'd be a disaster for them if Scotland wasn't using the pound for all kinds of balance of payments, transactional yep. costs, etc. other reasons that we know about. Okay, well Eva, you, you, are, uh, you work in business across Europe, particularly in Poland. You're both of Polish origin. I don't know if you're how you <laughs> describe <laughs> yourself in terms of your particular national status, but you spend a lot of t your time in Europe. What's your take on this currency question and whether or not it would be practical for Scotland to have its own currency? Well, um, I I think that uh, there is no any regulations which can stop taking uh, Scotland to have pound, mm. and uh, I think that it's the closest uh, um, decision just now. So, so it is the, the 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 best solution for this moment. But any different solution? Mm. Talk of the problems that, that you experience having to change currency between different countries and different regions. So. Uh, Polish is still in Złotych, not Zloty. Euro, yes. Mm. Um, Slovakia has uh, Euro. Mm. So uh, for sure you know that every change uh, make people worries, yes, yeah. and it's difficult in the first moment. Actually, Zloty has a nice yeah. ring to it. Do you think we can have a Zloty? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> but after the some time, I think that uh, this solution works. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's, what's Poland's take on Scotland's national destiny on the, on the issue that's dominating politics. Yeah, are they even conscious yeah. of it? Are they aware of it? Does it impinge on Polish consciousness at the moment? I think that it's, the, it's not the most popular topic in Pol Poland. <laughs> now, <laughs> oh, surprise, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> of course, there is the some articles and the some comments about it. The last was after uh, Tuesday debate. 
So what is uh, interesting that uh, the most comments were about uh, um, about Alex Talmond and uh, there was very neutral, but uh, but also about uh, mm, this that Scottish should manage the Scotland, yes, and it was mostly this um, this information, this message. Also, there was about uh, the opinion of the the the, 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 the second side, but uh, um, the main message was that. Uh, uh, it's only the one way for Scotland. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, which independent country would like to be not independent? So yeah, I don't well, know well this kind of and, and also in Poland, obviously, <laughs> Poland had its own independence uh, movement uh, from yeah. the Warsaw Pact, from the Soviet yeah. Empire, when that, that collapsed. Sure. So I mean, you know, it's a very, it's a very nationalistic country with a small n. So but also, there's on, on your borders, there's this issue of uh, Ukraine, where yeah. a kind of separatist movement is creating altogether a different kind of resonance in Poland. Mm. Yeah, for this moment it's the biggest topic in Poland. Mm. Uh, Poland from the beginning supports Ukraine. And uh, what is very interesting also according to Scotland is yes, that uh, two ways how you can be independent. Yes, So when you look uh, on Scottish example that you can go 18 and say yes without you know any blood, any fight, any uh, that people, so it's amazing that uh, it's so big chance to be independent in so easy way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder, I, didn't, I was just thinking about the, the you know, the wider business case mm -hmm. because I saw today, I, I didn't look at it too much, but more, yet more financial uh, companies are coming out. The big, the big ones who rumble about, you know, possible relocation of business. Is this what people ask when you go around and speak for business for Scotland at, uh, at events or whatever? Are people still worrying about that, that all the, the, you know, all the jobs are basically going to drift across the border? I think unless it's somebody who's in a specific a company where it's being raised by management in that company as an issue, then it does come up as an issue. But I think in general people um, are wise to it because they've heard it so often. And frankly, we heard it prior to the 79 referendum, we heard it from Standard Life and Scottish Widows prior to But there to is a separate point of because about referendum. regulators, for example, that potentially some of these financial companies would have to choose which system to be regulated under, and if most of their if most of their uh, clients, most of their customers are south of the border, they would choose to be regulated differently. Does that make it any different in your eyes? No, I mean, it's international business these days. I mean, these kind of companies, all kind of companies work across international borders all the time. And that's why from, from our perspective, you look at it and you think, well, well, what's the problem? You do business in 10 countries already, do business in 11 countries, what, what difference does it make? So uh, in, in that sense, I think it's, it's not the reality. This is, we've seen it before. But then the, the bulk of the Scots past. don't do business. I mean, maybe I speak wrongly, <laughs> um, but I imagine most small businesses in Scotland don't actually trade perhaps across 10 countries. Uh -huh. you, you're exceptional. Yeah. You two are backwards and forwards between <laughs> Scotland and Poland the whole time. Uh -huh. Would that just unnerve people who don't travel more often and realise that it ca it's relatively easy to do this? Well, I think it makes a few things. I know you're right in terms of small businesses. Most of them will just deal in their locality. That's the vast, vast majority of of small businesses, that's what they'll do. Businesses that trade international already, to them it's absolutely not an issue. There's, a, there's an interesting thought process there which says that for, for, for maybe medium-sized companies that are only trading in the UK, you then become in a position where you are trading internationally de facto, and it does kind of take away a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of the fears they might have about doing more business broader yep. in Europe, which is which may, may be helped. Just getting away, we've been trying to get away from the currency issue, sure. obviously. I, I was at the Business for Scotland conference. I was very interested because I mean, people say it's just an SNP mouthpiece. I don't think that's entirely fair, though it obviously supports uh, the Yes campaign. Um, but what struck me was I've never, heard a, I, I've never heard a group of businessmen or people who are seriously involved and in business women. and women with that kind of uh, social... I mean, Tony Banks, your chairman, he started off with a condemnation of the austerity policies of the UK government, not because it's just the, the damn Tory and South, but because of the social impact it was having. He said also that, you know, austerity doesn't work, as an economic strategy doesn't work, that it actually damages business. Now, I've never really heard that from any business leader or prominent business leader before. Well, it's a, it's a great, it's an important message, um, and the way I like to put it to people is it's hard to sell stuff to people who don't have any money. 
um, mm. and that kind of gets it through to business people. And um, so anyway, if you look at all of the successful countries we talk about, the Nordics and other European countries, the income distribution is much more flat. There's a lot of people in the middle of that curve with more money to spend on stuff, which helps get the economy going. It's kind of obvious when you think about it. And, uh, and you're right, being exposed to the, the business of Scotland, uh, and talking to dozens and hundreds of people within that environment, business people, um, it's taken as a given. Everybody agrees that the, the social agenda goes hand in hand with the economic agenda. Um, now, maybe that's because the, the, the business people that don't agree with that are all on the no side. That will be the case. But, but being absolutely right, it's a very, very strong strand of, of where we're coming from. Mm. It okay. almost strikes me, actually, it's a bit like as a cyclist in the world. Mm. If you're a cyclist and a motorist, when you're driving, you're always conscious of cyclists mm. because sometimes you're a cyclist as yeah. well. And when you've got a society where people are one thing or the other, when they don't experience both things, then it becomes a bit dodgy. Yeah. Um, you know, business people are mothers, fathers, workers sometimes. You know, if, if you are many things like that, I think you begin to realise that you, it's much better to have a consensual... You're a small business approach. person, aren't you? Exactly, I have a company. So, you know, when you are many things at once, it becomes a lot easier to see that consensus just actually reduces costs. To be absolutely blunt yes. about it, transaction costs are at their lowest with trust. Yes, uh, absolutely right. And, and that's the most effective business deals you do is with people you trust, mm -hmm. where you can go and enjoy a deal without having to worry about too much, uh, too much um, kind of legal, etc. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Ivan Ivan McKee, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What now? Well, now, after, after, <laughs> after having introduced him once already, oh, uh, right. now we will be keeping our Polish theme going somewhat. Yeah. Because yeah. we're also talking to the man who has uh, set up this venue. I think it, uh, it's his shout, the hill, the hill, I keep wanting to call it Hill Street kind of Hill blues. Street blues, yeah. We're not, you know, we're not going to go there. It's the Hill Street Theatre, and it's the man from Universal Arts who set it up. Venue 41, this is his venue. Would you please welcome <laughs> Paul <Next. laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Now, you've, managed to, you, you, you've robustly managed to sit down, knock off your microphone, which we nonetheless need you to have somewhere near your, your mouth. How fantastic. This I think is you may end up holding it, actually. That's, um, that's, that's the problem uh, with... Uh, it's got a bit of sticky with tape with on it. it. it it's it's got, got a bit of sticky and tape on it. You know, I can, I, I can do this. Because this you are... Now you can, put, you can stick it up there. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, whichever. Um, because you are also able to, to kind of there carry you these moments, Tom, well can you also pronounce your name properly? It's us? it's Borkovi, but you know because it's a uh, uh, partly Polish, partly German, it could be Borkovi. Right. <laughs> it, it it doesn't matter. I'm Polish. I am uh, and I call myself Scotticized Paul. And I've been in this country in in UK. Uh, for 32 years, and I'm uh, working for 25 years in Scotland. And uh, just as a matter of interest, um, how are you different as a Scottish-sized pole than when you were a pole pole? Uh, it, that I, you know, when I came to this country, I didn't understand a lot. Now I understand much more. And when I came to this country from Poland, and I escaped during the martial law in Poland, and Maggie Thatcher was my hero. And after a year, I just looked at what is going on around and I said something is wrong in this picture uh, and as well you know I lived 11 years in London and uh, during those 11 years I had a um, one English <coughs> friend the, all of them they were foreigners uh, Australians Americans and uh, um, 18 years ago I sent this guy to Poland for the holiday uh, 18 years and he's still there Right. So I, th he's bringing what, what is best of, of, of British to, to Poland, and I'm, uh, I hope that I bring what is best uh, of Polish to, to Scotland. Just to run that back a bit, you say you left Poland while it was under martial law, yes, after right. Jaruzelski in 1981. Yes, I escaped from Poland. I'm, I'm a public person. I'm, uh, I'm an actor. Um, and uh, you know, th thanks to George Harrison, I just got a completely false contract George um, Harrison, yes. the Beatle. As in my yes, sweet lord. Yes, be, because he, he used to run uh, uh, handmade films. And they, c they uh, created for me a completely false uh, c contract. And, okay. and I, I escaped from Poland. They, um, the Polish authorities gave me a three weeks uh, visa that I can g get out of the country. And I, I left Poland. Uh, and my year and a half old son, which I haven't seen for, for three years, 
and later, but, and, and I came here. But, you know, my history is not important. Important is the, important, the future of, the, of, of this country. But interesting, yes. Interesting, Because, right. you know, we're getting a sense of where people are coming from. And mm. Ava had mentioned, you know, uh, many, many Europeans will have had experience of much, much more well, bloodshed, actually, and, yeah. and, and really difficult ways to resolve constitutional problems. So I think that all of that's interesting. Oh, de oh, definitely, definitely. This is this is unique in a world, what we are what we are trying to do in, in Scotland. And, uh, you know, I, I support Yes campaign because it's the, the, the easiest way and uh, most fantastic way of, of, of changing from the... Uh, to be honest, colon colonized country to independent. Uh, do you country. see that? As, do you see Scotland as colonized? Oh, d you know, oh, I just feel it. I that. just feel it that we are northern territories of the uh, of, of of United Kingdom. You know, I just um, I, I travel around uh, Scotland, and you know, from from Edinburgh to London by train is four and a half uh, hours. From Edinburgh to Inverness is four and a half <laughs> hours as well. <laughs> so <laughs> something <laughs> is wrong in this picture. Yeah. So Maybe the Highlands of the colony. Yeah, oh yeah, you know, that's, that, that's the other thing. But mm, um, I think that, that uh, I hope, because we don't have a lot of time now, but I hope that uh, in the next uh, the couple of weeks, I would like to talk as well with you about the polls uh, in, in Scotland, because it's 100,000 uh, of us here. Yeah. Yes, I wanted and to ask you. Yeah, uh, because you're also leading Polish for yes. So what, what needs to happen there? Because um, would you like Alex Salmon to address that group? Definitely. I just believe that, because, you know, um, in Poland, we feel uh, that we are marginalized uh, by the, uh, the politicians. And here, if we can hear from Salmon, uh, that we are important, that a lot of them, they will vote yes. Because, you know, we are a nation who, we love uh, freedom. We were fighting 200 years for our freedom, 25 years ago we got it. It's not really right yet. Uh, but I think that this country uh, it has, has got a much better possibility to do it right from the first, first, first year. And I'm struck by your mm. numbers because 100,000, uh, correct me if I'm mm. wrong, Ian, I think is more than the cohort of the 16 and 17 year old voters. Oh, definitely. So that's a lot, a lot of people. That a lot of people, vote. a lot of votes, and that's why I, uh, apart from that, I'm running two big venues and, uh, and, and have a clients around the uh, festival. I just devote my, my time as well to, uh, to this independence yes campaign. Well, what, makes you so what makes you so certain, though, that, that many of them would be inclined to, to vote yes? Uh, uh, because, you know, they, they escaped, they, they went out of, of Poland because they were mar marginalized, that, uh, because they are not listened. And I believe that, that here I've been listened. I, you know, uh, uh, in December I, I bumped into uh, John Sweeney and I, and I said, I need to talk to you. Uh, months later, I had a lunch with him in, in, in the parliament. This is, this is unbelievable. This it cannot happen <laughs> in, in well the definitely. There's a story to tell your grandchildren. <laughs> lunch with John Sweeney. Yeah, well, John, you know what to do then. They say there's no such thing as a free lunch, but uh, if John can keep having them with five million voters, who knows what uh, could happen next. Anyway, um, that's all we have time for our right. first uh, referendum TV. Um, I want to just trail ahead to what's happening um, in the days ahead. Uh, tomorrow, actually, Tommy Shepherd of the Stand Comedy Club will be here. Uh, writer Former assistant secretary of the Scottish Labour Party. That too. Uh, writer and journalist Neil Asherson will be uh, here. Ian will be kind of linking the entire sort of. shaboodle, mm -hmm. joined by Michelle Thompson um, from Business for Scotland in the co-presenter's chair. Uh, just remains to thank everybody today, all our guests who have been fantastic and have put up with a slight amount of busking and lurking behind curtains and um, being pushed out into the into the um, into the watching gaze of our tiny but perfectly formed audience. Um, let me thank also our production team, who are all volunteers. Karen Kelly, who's our producer, Lucy Davidson, floor manager, Lewis Hamilton and Michael, not that one, but Lewis Hamilton and Michael Miller on the cameras, Linda Graham, our director, and Alison Balhari, our editor. And from Ian McQuarter and myself, thank you for watching Referendum TV. <laughs>